After telling his first real parable, the apostles are confused, and Jesus tells them that he doesn't want the crowds to understand the meaning. What you talking about, Willis? Does he not want them to repent and believe? In this episode of the Bible Paladin, Mark relates a series of parables in which he doubles down on this idea of the in crowd versus those on the outside. And after the first parable, we have what might be one of the most difficult passages to interpret, followed by probably the easiest. But we're getting ahead of ourselves right now. So let's first read the parable and also set the stage for where this parable occurs. The Sermon of Jesus takes place right after his latest run-in with the teachers of the law who refuse to acknowledge the authority of Jesus. In fact, they attribute it to the devil. Also, once again we hear of the crowds, those who seem to be following Jesus not for his teaching, but for his acts of healing. So let's get to the parable and see what Jesus has to say about this manner of teaching. We pray for the guidance of the Holy Spirit as we enter into the sacred scripture. Again, Jesus began to teach by the lake. The crowd that gathered around him was so large that he got into a boat and sat in it out on the lake, while all the people were along the shore at the water's edge. He taught them many things by parables, and in his teaching said, Listen, a farmer went out to sow his seed. As he was scattering the seed, some fell along the path, and the birds came and ate it up. Some fell on rocky places, where it did not have much soil. It sprang up quickly, but the soil was shallow. But when the sun came up, the plants were scorched, and they withered because they had no root. Other seed fell among thorns, which grew up and choked the plants, so that they did not bear grain. Still other seed fell on good soil. It came up, grew, and produced a crop, some multiplying thirty, some sixty, some a hundred times. Then Jesus said, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. When he was alone, the twelve and the others around him asked him about the parables. He told them, The secret of the kingdom of God has been given to you, but to those on the outside everything is said in parables, so that they may be ever seeing but never perceiving, and ever hearing but never understanding. Otherwise, they might turn and be forgiven. Once again, Jesus gets into a boat to teach because of the unrelenting crowds. And then he begins to preach by parables. And this word, when we often hear it today, is pretty much used exclusively to talk about the teachings of Jesus. But the word is a Greek word, parabole, which really means a comparison or an analogy. Literally, it means to be thrown beside. The idea of two separate meanings laying side by side. Of course, this type of storytelling was used by the Hebrew prophets of old, as well as various Jewish rabbis throughout their history, including contemporaries of Jesus. This genre was also popular with Greek philosophers and politicians as well. Also, many popular movies today can be seen as parables. You take the blue pill, the story ends, you wake up in your bed and believe whatever you want to believe. You take the red pill, you stay in Wonderland, and I show you how deep the rabbit hole goes. In simplest terms, a parable was a short story that signified a moral or religious lesson. And the stories themselves took everyday objects or activities that can be understood as something else. Remember, all I'm offering is the truth, nothing more. Follow me. Now, I'm not going to talk about the significance of the seeds in this parable yet, because Jesus will do that for us in the next few verses. But after the parable, he does say something that is a bit troubling. He says that people will see but not perceive. They will hear, but they will not understand. And then he says that this will happen so that they do not repent and believe. So how can we understand this? Well, first of all, we should understand that Jesus is, in fact, quoting the prophet Isaiah. Chapter 6, verses 9 and 10, to be exact. And this is no accident. If we read Isaiah in context, we see that God is sending his prophet to preach to the people once again. And once again, they will not repent. God is basically telling Isaiah that over and over again, the people do not listen, and God knows they will not listen. So they will go through the motions once again, and God will give them yet another chance. Because that's what heroes do. But once again, they will not repent. And this time they will suffer the consequences, for their nation will be conquered by Babylon and taken into captivity. And so what Jesus is doing by quoting the prophet is really both a callback as well as a new prophecy. We have already seen Jesus be rejected by the religious leaders after both John the Baptist and he had called them to repentance. We also see the crowds that keep following him, but haven't made any changes to their lives either. 
In reality, God gave his people yet another chance through Jesus, but once again, they did not repent. They saw and heard, but did not perceive, nor did they attempt to understand. So what Jesus is saying to the 12 and some of the others that are following him is that you have heard the truth and you believe, but I'm done with these other false followers. And so Jesus says that I will continue to explain to you and interpret these parables so that you will continue to understand and grow in your faith. But for the others, they've already hardened their hearts. Of course, in reality, Jesus still does give the crowds every chance to hear him and to convert, to repent and to follow him. Because that's what heroes do. We get it. And now if we understand why Jesus says this to his apostles, his explanation of the parable makes even more sense. So let's continue. Then Jesus said to them, don't you understand this parable? How then will you understand any parable? The farmer sows the word. Some people are like the seed along the path where the word is sown. As soon as they hear it, Satan comes and takes away the word that was sown in them. Others, like seeds sown on rocky places, hear the word and at once receive it with joy. But since they have no root, they last only a short time. When trouble or persecution comes because of the word, they quickly fall away. Still others, like seeds sown among thorns, hear the word, but the worries of this life, the deceitfulness of wealth, and the desires for other things comes in and choke the word, making it unfruitful. Others, like seed sown on good soil, hear the word, accept it, and produce a crop, some thirty, some sixty, and some a hundred times what was sown. In the explanation of the parable, Jesus tells the apostles and us exactly why there are some that hear his word, but do not follow him. And so I don't have to give any additional commentary on this parable. As Jesus says, Whoever has ears to hear, let them hear. So that's it then. But you know I'm not going to leave it at that. But what I will do is just sum up what Jesus said. There are three things that often will cause people to turn away from his teaching. And that is temptation, persecution, and material things. The message really is quite simple. And so I'm going to talk about something that Jesus doesn't say in the parable. When we hear this parable... Um, and so many of us probably didn't catch this the first time. I mean, I know I didn't because I'm not a farmer. But when you think about it, the farmer is really careless. I mean, seeds are precious. And he goes out to sow them and he just starts tossing them around like a madman. Some on the path, some on the rocks, and some on the thorns. The people listening must have been shaking their heads. What kind of sower would not carefully plant each seed in the fertile field? Well, Jesus, that's who. He begins his ministry by preaching the word everywhere, even to those who will not understand, even to those who have only a slim chance of following him. That's pretty amazing when you put this all together. The word of God is for everyone, and that's a message that the apostles will eventually learn. Jesus is greater than Isaiah, who was set up to fail. Because that's what he wrote. Okay, enough of that. Let's get to the next parable, because that will continue to explain what Jesus is saying. He said to them, do you bring in a lamp to put it under a bowl or a bed? Instead, don't you put it on its stand? For whatever is hidden is meant to be disclosed, and whatever is concealed is meant to be brought out into the open. If anyone has ears to hear, let them hear. Consider carefully what you hear, he continued. With the measure you use, it will be measured to you, and even more. Whoever has will be given more. Whoever does not have, even what they have will be taken from them. A bit cryptic, but these two parables really just continue the message that we have already heard. It also acts as a particular message for the apostles and the early church. Remember, he had just chosen his 12 and is already preparing them for their ministry. Jesus is the light and is sharing himself with the world, but much of the world is not ready for him. This, of course, will be one of the central themes in the Gospel of John. His message is one that is meant to be shared, and while many do not understand, the message will indeed be proclaimed. Those who hear and understand the message have a responsibility to share it and not keep it hidden. For Jesus may be speaking in riddles and parables, but the apostles' responsibility will be then to take it out to the world and proclaim it in such a way that they will understand. They cannot hide. They cannot keep it hidden after the message has really been received. And we can assume that he is talking directly to the apostles when he speaks again about measuring and understanding, even though he is speaking to the crowds. 
You can almost imagine Jesus' glance and wink at them when he says these words. They have been given much, that is, understanding. And that understanding will continue to grow and flourish as the Holy Spirit continues to work within him. And yet those who do not understand, who have chosen not to repent and to follow Jesus, even that little insight that they may have had will eventually go away. This is not a punishment, but just an explanation of what will happen. But for those who believe, that seed that has already taken root will begin to do something quite amazing. He also said, This is what the kingdom of God is like. A man scatters seed on the ground, night and day, whether he sleeps or gets up. The seed sprouts and grows, though he does not know how. All by itself, the soil produces grain, first the stalk, then the head then the full kernel in the head. As soon as the grain is ripe, he puts the sickle to it, because the harvest has come. Again he said, What shall we say the kingdom of God is like? Or what parable shall we use to describe it? It is like a mustard seed, which is the smallest of all seeds on earth. Yet when planted, it grows and becomes the largest of all garden plants, with such big branches that the birds can perch in its shade. With many similar parables, Jesus spoke the word to them as much as they could understand. He did not say anything to them without using a parable. But when he was alone with his own disciples, he explained everything. Jesus begins these two parables by talking about the kingdom of God. And this is a phrase that is used quite often in the Gospels, but not always in the same way. There are two ways in which we can typically understand kingdom of God. Sometimes it really refers to the future state of Christians, the way in which we might talk about heaven. Other times, like here, it refers to the kingdom that begins with Christ and continues as his church begins to spread. And so it is the kingdom that we are living in right now. And so, as many theologians have said, this is about the kingdom that is already here, but not yet. And so it reveals something that continues to the end of time. And that seems to be what these parables are referring to. The first parable talks about how the kingdom grows in terms of mystery and time. The second speaks about how the kingdom will spread. There are many messages in these multivalent stories. The parable of the seed clarifies that while the disciples may have been fertile ground, it is God who causes the seed to grow and develop. And that will take time. Faith is not a one-and-done thing, but it requires patience in the process. The faith will continue to mature over time. But this parable is really not about personal faith as much as it is about a communal faith, really the community. For Jesus begins the parable by saying the kingdom of God is like the seed. And so what he is saying is that his church will take time and patience in order to grow. And for the early Christians and those hearing this message, they may have been hearing that really Jesus may not be returning as quickly as they thought that he would, but their church would continue to develop until the true time is ripe. As Jesus said, the time for the harvest, as he said in the other parable. And so for them, the church, they must be patient to continue to grow and mature as well. And finally, the last parable about a seed in the section is that of the mustard seed. Sometimes people confuse this story with the one about the faith of a mustard seed, which can be found elsewhere in Matthew and Luke's gospel. And while that is important, that is not the meaning of this parable. Here, Jesus is talking about the kingdom of God that he is ushering in on the earth. And the meaning is fairly simple. It is hard to imagine something so small growing into something so large. Jesus' small group of apostles, armed only with the good news and the authority of Jesus, would become a community that will stretch across the earth. And like the seed from the previous parable, while they may plant the seed, it is only by the power of God that it grows into what God wants it to be. But there's more. Like the parable of the sower that we began this section with, there is an element of humor as well to the story, and one that will probably upset the teachers of the law. For when you think about it, mustard bushes were not the type of bush that you particularly wanted around. They were invasive, intrusive, big, messy, and with all the birds nesting in its branches, noisy and dirty as well. Some rabbis even considered these plants to be unclean and required them to only be planted outside the city. This is because these mustard bushes would cross boundaries and take over nearby fields, violating the law against planting two kinds of seed in the same field. So why would Jesus compare the kingdom of heaven to a mustard seed, something unclean, uncontrollable, and unpredictable? Well, I think I just answered my own question. 
He wanted to make the crowds uncomfortable. The kingdom of God would be like something that they had never experienced, never even imagined before. I mean, it would be something that would include even those who were considered unclean, you know, like Gentiles and tax collectors. It would invade every part of one's life. It's not something that you can ignore. That's the kingdom of God. So is this the kingdom that you want to be part of? This messy and unpredictable group of people that will probably make you feel uncomfortable? Well, this is the kingdom that Jesus is calling his people to. And many of them are turning away. The great thing about the parables of Jesus is that they were recorded for the church and are as meaningful in our time as they were back then. Even today, many may hear the word, as in these parables, and realize that it's not what they were expecting. It requires change. It requires action. It requires patience. And it's inclusive. Change, because the parable of the sower indicates that if the word of God takes root in us, we turn away from that which would lead us astray. We reject the things in this life that will take away the good news and cause sin and doubt. This is repentance. We must not falter even when we are ridiculed because of our faith or experience difficult times. We are warned that the stresses of life and chasing after material wealth can also cause the word to be choked before it bears fruit. To be a follower of the Lord requires repentance and change. Action. Because the parable of the lamp on a stand tells us that upon hearing the word, we cannot keep it hidden. If you are excited or passionate about something, do you keep it to yourself or do you want to share it with others? Jesus is telling his apostles that the light on a stand, the light that they have heard, must be shared. It must be proclaimed. Patience. Because the parable of the growing seed tells us that this process does not happen overnight. And we may even get discouraged because we cannot see or understand what's happening. It requires patience and trusting in God's time or Kairos time. And this is something that allows our faith to mature and grow. But not just for ourselves, but for the church too. And we must not get discouraged when things seem to be happening slowly because Jesus reminds his disciples that God is in charge. Inclusivity, because the parable of the mustard seed tells us that the seed that is the good news and subsequent faith in Jesus the Christ will grow into a great community that will spread across the earth and have branches big enough for all people. I don't think Jesus was just talking about certain people because he uses a mustard bush as his analogy. This was an unclean and unlikable plant. And also he wasn't talking about a whole bunch of little isolated bushes. He's creating one kingdom, one universal church that includes everyone and spreads across boundaries and barriers. That's something we're thinking about. And finally, the question from these stories in the gospel that is asked to its readers is, where do you stand? Where do I stand? Am I ready to have my life interrupted and changed because I've decided to hear the word of God? And not just hear it, but understand it, to believe it, to follow, to really have that seed rooted, take root in my heart and change the way in which I see the world, to change my worldview. I would really love to hear about your own faith journey and perhaps where you first encountered the Lord. So thank you so much for joining me today, and I really look forward to seeing you next time when we will talk more about the power and authority of the Lord. Until then, take care and God bless.